Hello YouTube, this is Solink Smash here, and welcome back to Max's Commentary! I know it's been quite a long time since I did my first episode, but we're back, partially in celebration for the 10th anniversary of my channel, and also because I've been meaning to do this for a very, very long time, I'm going to be re recording a commentary track over my all-time favorite film, Whisper of the Heart, a Studio Ghibli film directed by Yoshifumi Kondo, based on the manga by Aoi Haragi, with storyboards and screenplay by Hayao Miyazaki. You know, that guy. It was released in 1995. Uh, it was a huge success in Japan and has barely made a blip in the United States. There was an English dub released in 2006 by Disney, and it has been released on DVD and Blu-ray and has also since been reissued by G-Kids. Um, it was also recently in cinemas um, this past July, July 2019. Uh, for the Ghibli Fest 2019 special event. It's the first time it's ever had a widespread theatrical release in North America. And I went to see it both days, and I was, I was very happy about it. So, depending on what version of the film that you have, uh, it might have a different starting point. So, when I count down, I'm going to be starting from when the Studio Ghibli logo first shows up. You know, the blue screen with Totoro on it. And for full disclosure, I will be watching the Japanese version with English subtitles. Uh, you can follow along with the English dub if you like. If I mention something that seems kind of weird or like not what's exactly what's happening, it's probably because I'm talking about the Japanese version. Uh, I know the two very well, and I know their differences, so I will definitely bring up some of those as they come along. I'm actually kind of worried that I'm not going to have enough time in this entire thing to cover everything that I want to talk about with this movie, because it is my all-time favorite film, and I know pretty much everything about it. Uh, so I'll do my best, and hopefully you will enjoy it. Okay, so I'm going to start it in three, two, one, go. All right, there's the Studio Ghibli logo and the credits presenting Whisper of the Heart. The film opens with Olivia Newton-John's rendition of Take Me Home Country Roads, which is the main theme of the film, originally, of course, the John Denver song. And it's a major plot point in this film that one of the characters tries to translate it into Japanese. Uh, the English dub obviously changes this because it doesn't make sense that you're trying to translate an English song into English again. So it's just alternate lyrics, which, honestly, they do the best that they can with it. Uh, I love these opening shots so much. I love just relaxing and have, letting this all wash over me. This, is the, this was the first Ghibli film that used a digital soundtrack. It was released with Dolby Digital, but it was the last Ghibli film to be created without any help with computer generation. Uh, CG imagery was first introduced into Ghibli films with Mononoke. And you can see in the previous shot and this one, uh, a brief glimpse of the World Emporium, or the Earth Shop as it was known in previous drafts of <laughs> the script. So uh, I've read, I've listened to the Image album, I've read the original manga that it's based, that this film is based on, I've read the storyboards, um, I know a lot about this film's development just sort of from consuming all that material. We get our first glimpse of our main character, Shizuku, Tsugi, Shizuku Tsukishima, um, coming out of the, the market there. She's played by Yoko Hana in the Japanese version and Brittany Snow in the English version. Uh, I don't really like how she's written in the English dub. I think she's a lot more mature and a lot more um, relatable of a character in the original Japanese version, but I think Brittany Snow does a good job with uh, what she's given. So obviously there's the contrast there between Country Roads being this famous country song that's beloved in Japan as well as in the United States over these shots of a city at night. Specifically, it's Tama Town, which is a district of Tokyo. It is a real place, and there's many different spots in the film that actually exist in real life. Um, and if you go visit Tama Town, in, in, uh, they still have posters and stuff and directions, maps that will show you where to find all the different locations from the film. 
So this film takes place in 1994, uh, which you can get from the sort of laptops that they're working on, the electronic notebooks, as they're referring to it. And then here, the library that Shizuku's dad works at uh, is switching to a barcode system. Is one of my the th the themes from this film that really sticks with me is uh, you know the transferring of uh, optical to digital t uh, technology, and it's reflected in the filmmaking. As I mentioned, this was the last film made before digital graphics, um, but the first one made with a digital soundtrack. So it's already in that sort of liminal state of transition. And the way that this film the film plot works, where Shizuku finds the name of this guy, Seiji Amasawa, uh, on all of these book cards, uh, that this would not exist in a different time, right? Like, nowadays, you wouldn't be able to do this. There's, a bar there's barcodes, you wouldn't be able to check who checked out the books all before you. So it's very specifically in its time and place, and the social-cultural impact of the story and Shizuku's decisions in it plays a major role, and that's also partially the, one of the reasons why I always think the Japanese version of this film in particular is far superior to the English dub. Usually, Disney's English dubs that they do of Ghibli films are done really well, because they're set in fantasy worlds, um, and the script reflects the original intent of the Japanese script really well. But in this film, they had to sort of change it because the characters, I feel the, the characters originally might have been a little bit too subversive for Disney's tastes. So a lot of the changes made to them and their decisions uh, and their attitudes reflect more of like conventional American children rather than the fully more complex people that they actually are. Now, I haven't mentioned the musical score yet. It's done by Yuji Nomi, not Joe Hishiyashi, which is the common uh, Ghibli composer. Uh, Yuji Ono also went on to compose The Cat Returns, which is a more well-known film in the West than this, even though The Cat Returns is technically a spinoff of Whisper of the Heart, and I will mention how it connects as it is relevant. Uh, this theme is called Okanomachi, A Hilly Town. This is the leitmotif of the first half of the film. Uh, this blimp that you see here, I always thought there was something significant about it, and it turns out there's a big part in the original manga where it ends with Shizuku and Seiji and um, their respective siblings, because in the manga, Seiji has an older brother, and they all go on a blimp together, <laughs> um, because uh, Shizuku sort of has this desire where she's always wanted to fly on a blimp which is reflective of the original mangaka as well. She actually got the chance to fly on a blimp with Miyazaki when the film got when the manga got picked up for a film. That shot in particular where she's putting her hand up uh to block the sun. That's taken straight from the manga. I was really impressed first up of how the final film reflects the storyboards so well and the storyboards ref some of the shots in them reflect the original manga panels really well. So it's visually very consistent. And while the plot of the film is altered, quite it's quite different from the original manga uh, in terms of the themes and what it focuses on and just a broader sense of the storytelling, I think the film is superior, but it's a great adaptation as well. Uh, so, back to the leitmotif I was talking about. It recurs several times throughout the first half of the film and then gets replaced by a different theme that sort of is the theme of the second half. In fact, the entire film is divided into two halves pretty evenly, with a central scene sort of being the centerpiece of the entire film. It's sort of like a chiastic film structure, and I'll point that out as we get there. High school entrance exams, of course, this being one of the things that sort of got fudged over in the English dub a little bit. In Japan, high school is not compulsory. You have to take an entrance exam to get into it. Uh, and also, it's three years. And so even though Shizuku is a third-year middle schooler, basically, which is the equivalent to an American high school freshman... Here we got donated Amasawa's collection... Uh, some of the subtitles on the original 2006 DVD were messed up, and so some of it got fixed in the uh, J, J in the sorry the G Kids re-release. I keep saying J wrong. I keep calling it J Kids. 
Here we have Yoko. Um, or Yuko, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Yuko. This is Shizuku's best friend. Notably voiced by Ashley Tisdale in the English dub. Uh, around the time I think she was doing Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, but I think before High School Musical. So, um, she does a pretty good job, actually. And then here we have Shizuku showing off her lyrics to her best friend. I tried, but it's not going to work. Why not just sing it in English? That's what she says in the original. Um, the idea is that she's just trying to translate the song into Japanese, but obviously it's not a straight translation. I mean, it is a little bit at first, but she's also adding in her own elements. Uh, but she doesn't like it. She thinks it's trite. And I find that really significant that, you know, she's grown up in the city this entire life and she's trying to write about some country road that she loves and longs for. And it's like, well, I've never lived in the country. I don't really know what that feels like. So I'm just saying a bunch of cliches. It doesn't actually feel like good writing, which is why she's motivated to write the parody Concrete Roads about what her experience is actually like. Uh, of course, later on, when she rewrites the lyrics, it's more along the lines of a metaphorical country road. It's like a path that she wants to go back to. She wants to go back to the previous version of herself where she felt happier uh, while also moving forward and figuring out what she wants to do with herself. But she's stuck in this weird liminal space where she doesn't really know where to go. Again, liminal space is being a prominent theme in this film, in the subtext. I love the way that the romance is handled in this film because there are, it is a very specific, you know, middle school, high school romance, love plot, love triangle going on here. But, and while it's dramatic and it's, you know, suitably significant for the character's motivations, it's, it's not, it's not overdone to the point of cliches getting in the way of, uh, the story being told and when the romance needs to take a backseat to character development and to learning about these people it does and i really appreciate that about this film here we got sugimura Something else I should bring up about this film while we're while we're on the topic is the way that Shizuku's worldview is, is that she lives in this, you could argue, mundane environment, city environment that millions of people live in, and it's hot and it's overbearing, and it shouldn't really be something that people look for in uh, the kind of place that they want to live in. But for Shizuku, she sees everything in the lens of the fantasy stories that she enjoys. And so everything to her is like a grand open adventure. And I think the music really reflects that. Um, also, beautiful background right here. Um, just, just visually, this film is gorgeous. But I think that goes without saying. <laughs> um, and we, we see a moment where sort of Yuko... Uh, I keep mixing up the names now. We see the moment where Shizuku's worldview sort of comes to a head toward the middle of the film when she's talking to Moon. And I'm not going to spoil a whole lot of what happens in the movie ahead of time. But there's a moment when she says to herself, why do we change? I know that the world isn't actually like this. Like, I know that things aren't always as easy like in fantasy stories, like in fairy tales. Um, what do I do? Um... Here we have our first appearance of the mysterious stranger, um, who is as of yet unnamed, although all of the story descriptions and box art love to spoil it. By the way, the the English box art, like the, I should say, the DVD description, uh, especially for the 2006 DVD, is terrible. <laughs> it does not reflect what this film is about at all. <laughs> Alright, here's the next music track in the film, which is not on the soundtrack. It's more of 
I think the only ones that made it onto the soundtrack are ones that the orchestra was involved in. The more electronic, quirky score that sort of fit, fills some of the other scenes doesn't quite make it in. Um, this, I believe, was just the Concrete Roads like theme um, that Yuji no Mi wrote for the Image album that just got carried over into... All right, whatever. If you're watching this commentary, you've seen this film before. It's Seiji, right? <laughs> so it carries over into, like, Seiji's theme for the first half of the film, basically, when you're not quite sure what to think about him. I should point out that there's a witch uh, doll hanging in Shizuku's room. Uh, that's a reference to Kiki's delivery service. Here, when she's in tears, I'm. this is something that I'm... Uh, conflicted about it like is it just her eyes getting tired from reading for so long is it her still being upset about what had happened with what seiji called her writing or is she crying about the book it's ambiguous here we have shizuku's sister shiho who gets on shizuku's case all the time uh, and is sort of the mature one, and Shizuku knows her responsibilities, but she doesn't really want to have to face them. Um, and Shiho does not really help her. <laughs> she just argues and complains about it without really giving her any proper motivation. <laughs> she reminds me a lot of one of my older sisters. <laughs> I relate to Shizuku quite often, and she's the character i think in anything that i relate to the most uh although i find elements of myself in most characters in this film which is part of the reason why i love it so much and it why it's means something so much to me personally but it's also a very universal story shizuku's story is the story of any adolescent struggling to find their place in the world regardless of social or gender barriers or anything anyone can really relate to this character and that's really something special um lovely vacuum cleaner to wake up to <laughs> this film is is pretty leisurely paced it takes its time there's a lot of plant and payoff uh very small details i love the computer in the background by the way um and part of this sets up the way that Shiho and Shizuku share the room and it sort of bothers her and that sort of comes to a head toward the film's conclusion. The other thing I love about this film is, you know, there's no villain. Shizuku is our main character, and she's the one that we see everything from the perspective from, but she isn't always right, and n there isn't really any characters in this film who are always right. I mean, maybe Nishi, but even then, I don't know if trying to motivate your grandson into studying in Italy is necessarily the best thing, but who knows. This, I didn't quite understand the significance of this scene either where she's like your boyfriend and it's ambiguous whether or not it is actually your boyfriend but i'd realized it's a reference to the original manga where she is sending letters to the boyfriend who it happens to be seiji's older brother but seiji's older brother is not in this film um a good choice i think um and also, the art that they both are interested in is different. So uh, Seiji's brother is into photography. First off, that shot right there of the train moving back and forth, beautiful shot, done before anything digital, absolutely fantastic. Anyway, uh, Seiji's brother's into photography. Seiji's into painting, not into violin or music, uh, which is a good fit for a manga where you can just stare at the art for as long as possible. But it's not necessarily an equal fit for a film so they changed it so that seiji is into music and specifically crafting violins uh which is something that lends itself more to a cinematic format here we have our first appearance of moon the cat who is also called muta or ball or tama he goes by a lot of different names 
And also, Muta, he, he goes by Muta more specifically in The Cat Returns. I should also mention that the Baron and Muta make appearances in The Cat Returns, but they look very different. Uh, but they're like some of the central characters. The Cat Returns, I believe, is roughly based around the idea that Shizuku, it's like basically what Shizuku's story ends up being when she polishes it. Um, in fact, that reminds me that I was, I saw this film with a friend when we went to see it in theaters, and he was, uh, confused by the abru- abruptness of the ending, which I also was the first time I watched the film. He was like, I thought we were going to see what Shizuku's final story looked like, and I was like, yeah, well, that's just not what we saw. Uh, although I should point out to him that he, if he wants to see that story, he should just go watch The Cat Returns. <laughs> Uh, That music track that just played there is a variation on what ended up being Moon's theme, uh, the Chasing the Cat theme, which started in the Image album and then carried over into the final version soundtrack. Although that's a bit of a prelude, we hear the full version uh, very shortly after this, in just uh, a few seconds. We'll hear the rest of the track. The first part is not on the soundtrack, but the second part is on the official soundtrack. Also, this spot right here, where she's looking at, is a lot like the spot that the girl in the cat returns it is at when she finds the Baron for the first time. Um, those hills right there are actual hills, uh, and the roads and the way they go, they zigzag up. That's just like in real life Tama Town. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen the cat returns, by the way, and I really should rewatch it one of these days, especially to pick out all of the musical similarities. Because apparently the Baron's theme, which makes his first appearance in this film, obviously. Is also in that film, so I should rewatch it. It's been a long time. I mean, it goes without saying, I adore this film soundtrack. Um, very underrated, especially among Ghibli soundtracks. I just love how Ghibli heroes and heroines just sort of go their own way. They don't really care about (laughs) no entrance signs. They chase what they're looking for. And this is funny because, as we see later on in the film, there are other ways to get up to the top of the hill where she finds the world emporium. Less ways that are, like, backward and, like, off the beaten path uh but the way that she follows moon up to it reflects sort of you're entering the hidden tunnel of your favorite fantasy story right to a place that you never knew existed um kind of reminds me of spirited away when shihiro goes through the passage uh to reach the other realm Another fantastic shot coming up here. This one. One of my favorites. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of other things about this film that I love that are just sort of like random things. Well, here's another here's another series of shots I really love. Uh, this one facing down on Shizuku as she's running. <laughs> Just love her passion and energy for these things. It's a nice BMW. I believe that's what that is. So this roundabout area here um, is is the, this this does exist uh, in real life Tama Town. The World Emporium unfortunately doesn't, but I believe it is at the Studio Ghibli theme park that is either open already or going to open at some point in the near future in Japan. Um, I know that the World Emporium is actually in that set, among all of the other buildings, which I really love. Uh, Ayui Hiragi 
the original mangaka of this film of this film of whisper of the heart loves cats so that should be pretty obvious that she made two of the central characters of her story cats i should point out the film's japanese title is mimi wo sumasuba which means if you listen closely uh it's more of like an arc phrase in the um original manga uh whereas in the film it mostly just serves a thematic purpose and again just like in the manga serves as the title of shizuku's story that she ends up writing here we have the world emporium originally called the earth shop um which the film uh soundtrack that you hear is a completely different uh tune from the one that was originally written for it which you can hear on the image album uh, neither of them, to my musical knowledge, ever like reprise in the film itself and in the other point. So it's pretty much just a completely unique track, although some of the instrumentation would show up later in the Engel Zimmer track. Uh, here, for these shots, when you see the Baron for the first time, I almost never notice from my first few watch-throughs that Shizuku is reflected in the mirror above him and i love how this shop is full of like fairy tale imagery where something like that is like alice through the looking glass and as we will see later the the clock when it strikes past 12 it's literally cinderella she leaves her lunch inside of the earth shop so that seiji has to go chase after her down the hill you know instead of down the steps it's like instead of a glass slipper it's just her dad's lunch um there's some really clever um fairy tale references in the plot of the film which you know reflects its content and its theme i love how that all comes together also the this is your first hint that maybe the baron is the magic cat like that moon and the baron are the same cat but there's a and that sort of tension is built throughout the whole film that you never see the two of them together. And, you know, sometimes the Baron's just mysteriously gone. Uh, but that tension is released at the end of the film, and we'll see that when we get there. Uh, and in instead, the way that the, the Baron's eyes glint is, ref is explained later as the Engel Zimmer inside of the eyes. Uh, now, this clock was not in the original. You can see Porco Rosso is written on the clock face. Um, in fact, I don't think there was really an analog to it. I think it was just the Baron. Actually, I have the original manga right here. I can just check for myself. Yep, so she meets the Baron. She meets Nishi. Oh, and she picks up glasses. That's right. The glasses don't make their way into the final film. Because I think they just say it makes her look like an old woman. <laughs> Anyway, we see the dwarves here, and I love what Nishi says, where he says, Oh, you're a young lady that knows about dwarves, huh? <laughs> it's more of a Western uh, archetypes, I suppose. Although, I guess he must, he must just be surprised that it's not... Youngsters are interested in fairy tales at all at this point in time given there's a major generational gap at this point in um, Japanese history. We have erifu, because fairy and elf in Japan are the same word. Now, in the, in the English dub, they specifically mentioned that the, the princess is cursed to turn into a sheep but the curse isn't mentioned originally originally it's just you know they're in love but the sheep only turns into a princess just um when the clock is striking 12 but he appears at every hour to see it there's like really small details that just don't make their way into the english dub and they don't really matter ultimately in terms of like the overall story, but they do matter from a thematic point of view, especially the way that the King of the Dwarves and the, the Elf Queen 
as actually that's the name of the soundtrack of this scene the elf queen which reprises later on during nishi's dream of louisa um the way that they live in two different worlds the way that shizuku and seiji do as well there's a parallel there this song right here is one of my favorite in the entire film and it's not on the soundtrack and it makes me very upset but it's a reprisal of okanomachi the main theme of the first half of the film which is sort of reflecting uh, the town that Shizuku lives in and her own sort of fantastic point of view of it. The music is bigger than the visuals. It reminds me a lot of the way that Back to the Future's score is a big sweeping orchestral score that raises the film up from just being a silly 80s comedy to something with more grandeur. And it's the same thing that happens here, where it's not just some 90s shoujo romance story. It's there's so there's a lot of like thematic material that is really significant also the shot of her running down the stairs i didn't mention but that gets reprised in my favorite shot of the film later on <laughs> in the manga the two of them meet up many 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 times and just sort of like verbally spar before she finally learns his name is seiji and they sort of get over their differences toward the end of the manga. Honestly, the whole thing is sort of set up as a mystery, of which the film only really does half of. I love her line here where she says, I felt like I found hidden treasure buried in a cave, then when someone said, buried me alive. Uh, because later on, it gets paid off, when after she learns Seiji's name, and she says, oh no, first I was buried alive, and now the sky has fallen in. That is not maintained in the English dub, but it's a great line, and I wish it was in that, but it's not. Checking the cards once again. A scene pretty much exactly like this plays out in the manga as well. Although she also she also has very big verbal and facial reactions to the stuff that she reads, which <laughs> distracts the other library uh, people who are reading and such. This music here, The End of Summer, uh, this is a, was originally Seiji's theme in the Image album. Obviously you can hear the violin. Um... But yeah, I love that when you know the context that this is Seiji's theme and you know that he's on her mind and it's mysterious and it is the end of summer, right? The rain is starting to come, which we see in the next scene. And actually we see it foreshadowed here in the clouds as she's walking home um, where she's not feeling herself, you know, just like she reflects later on in the film. Uh, this original theme for Seiji gets reprised one more time in the film. I love the way that this is shot, where it cuts straight to the next day, and Shizuku's just standing in the door, totally confused and discombobulated, just like we are, because we've just been moved to the next scene. And we're like, whoa, it's raining? What? It's the next day? And her expression is pretty much exactly what the audience feels at that cut from the previous afternoon where it's kind of cloudy to now it's raining where you know you can't sort of ignore that these things that are bottled up inside sort of the inevitability of growing up more thematic material here we, we continue the yuko subplot I love the expressions, like the little tiny um, acting details of the faces in in this film. It's f amazing, like how such sm subtle emotions can be communicated through such a small change on the face.
<laughs> this film was also just really funny. <laughs> In addition to just being excellent thematically and as a dramatic adolescent story. <laughs> It's full of little cute moments, especially in this subplot. <laughs> this scene is also in the original manga. It's going to take some water. Koichi Amasawa interests me, given that he donates books from his collection to the library, so obviously he's interested in books in, of some form, um, but yet he's against his son, you know, going off against art, so it's a this interesting dichotomy about the character. I also like how, uh, at least in the Japanese script, uh, Seiji is given as Koichi's youngest son implying that he has an older brother, which he does in the original manga, who does not appear in this film. Also, Shizuku's sister is a very different character in the manga than she is in uh, the film. In the film, she's a lot more combative towards Shizuku and is sort of like the voice of society telling her like the things that she should be doing and uh, just being combative, whereas she's very nice and actually ends up going on a double date with her <laughs> at the end of the story. Um, that is also one of the few times that uh, Shizuku and Seiji meet that are also in the manga and in the film as well. Because uh, they meet more in the manga, as I said before. Now, um, Shizuku's friends are not given specific names in, uh, like, specifically identified, but their names are Ki Kinyo and Mao, I believe. Um, or now, actually. I don't remember which one is which, but Kinyo is actually mentioned by, uh, Yuko later on in the film. I think they're identified in the manga, though. They're great characters. I should also mention that Yokohana, the voice of Shizuku, originally uh, played a character in Only Yesterday, the Isao Takahata film from 1991, when she was much younger. Uh, and I have not seen that yet, but I really, really want to, because I hear it's a lot like this film. <laughs> Now, these lyrics that she gives her friends right here, these are her final lyrics. This, this is what she sings uh, with Seiji in the midpoint of the film, and then it's the same that's sung in the end credits. But in the English dub, they mess it up by having it a whole separate set of lyrics, which I guess could be, you know, Shizuku refines her work more, but it's more significant that the work that actually connects with her friends that they compliment her on, not just like, you're a good writer, but it's like, no, this is really good. I really love these details. And it says, we can give this to the juniors and sing it at the teacher's thank you. That's third year. So basically, that's just the graduating class. Um, they really love it. And having Shizuku change it after, like, seeing how it connects with people, uh, it doesn't really fit thematically with the rest of the film. That shot of her stretching out against the sun, and she says, oh, the sun's come out. That's straight up from the original manga. And I should also mention in the dub, she says, wow, I love being a writer. <sighs> I mean, and that's the thing. She's not really supposed to realize that what she wants to do is right. At least, like, not like, consciously make that decision. 
um, until later on in the film. So it's kind of jumping the gun a little bit. And my bi- one of my bigger problems with the English dub of this film, besides, you know, all the different character and story changes, is that the whole arc for Shizuku and how she grows, it's so much more muddled, and it makes the film, like, seem like it's slower paced than it is, because the beats don't really connect as easily as they do when you're watching the original Japanese version. So basically, if you're watching the dub right now, I'm sorry <laughs> that I've just been trashing it on it this whole time. I promise I don't want to not like it. I don't have a problem with dubs in general. It's just this one specifically just doesn't do so great. And that and that makes me really upset because I know people are going to watch the dub probably more than they watch the original subtitles. And so I want this, my favorite film, to be as good as possible whenever new people watch it. So I'm I'm upset that the dub is not as good as it should be. It makes me want to make a fan dub. Someone uh, someone get in touch with me about that. <laughs> World Emporium. This lady riding on the bike always reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Which I guess you could also count as another fantasy nod if you really want to read into everything, clearly as I have. You know, it's one thing to read into everything, and it's another thing to be like, hey, this is how you analyze literature and works of art. Also, no, that's not the (laughs) lo-fi hip-hop beeps to study to, but it looks a lot like it, doesn't it? (laughs) We see a Shizuku's father smoking in the background. We don't really see it all that much, uh, except for later on in the film, uh, where we're like, oh, I didn't know he smoked, but he does in the background of some of these scenes. Now, here's a major story change from the dub to the sub. So, in the original, it's just the guy who writes the love letter tells Sugimura to ask Yuko to answer the letter. But in the dub, Sugimura is specifically tries to convince Yuko to go out with his friend. That's a pretty major character motivation change. And I guess they made it to sort of simplify the whole situation. Which, you know, is not necessarily a bad change. It's just a one I'm not really sure, like, if it's really beneficial. I think it changes Sugimura's character more than anything. This track here, um, A Confidential Talk, this is originally Moon's theme from the Image album, and it got sort of repurposed when the Chasing the Cat theme became the catch-all Moon theme. Um, This was supposed to be more of, like, the silly side of Moon. Uh, But it just ended up being used for this semi-comedic moment uh, in the final film. A lot of longer versions of some of these tracks you can find in their image album counterparts. Actually, the soundtrack version of that cue lasts quite a bit longer. I wonder if they tried to track it into the following scene and then thought that it would work better with silence. I should try to add that in, see if that, like, makes sense. (sighs) Man, I wish I had a secluded temple to talk about my love troubles to back in middle school. (laughs) Now, this argument scene is very different in the dub versus the sub. It, It does that classic thing where when a character is not shown speaking on screen they just add dialogue to that character when they didn't have it originally there's a really big example of that in this scene the overall story of the scene is relatively the same right she's like yuko likes you but he's like no way and depending on the version he'll say no way i don't need this or no way what am i gonna do and then shizuku says what do you think yuko feels like (laughs) So, there's a slight translation difference depending on which version you're watching. And then here we have the reveal that Sugimura has actually been had a crush on Shizuku this entire time. 
And this is a really important change where originally it's just she doesn't have a boyfriend, but she only sees Sugimura as a friend. And it's sort of implied that she kind of is like waiting for Seiji, but she doesn't really know who Seiji is. So it's a, a weird sort of different thing. Whereas in the dub, it's specifically for the purpose where she's not going to hurt Yuko's feelings. She wouldn't do that to Yuko. And I actually kind of like that change. I think it's, it's, um, it makes sense. This is a major example where in the original, Sugimura says, we'll just be friends forever. And then that's Shizuku nodding. And he says, I see. And he lets go and walks away silently. Whereas... In the English dub, he's more angry and curt and to the point, and Shizuku is not replying. He just says, fine, we'll just be friends. I'll never mention it again. And she just nods for no reason, because they kept the animation the same. And then he walks away angrily, rather than sadly. So the context changes based on just adding dialogue where it wasn't there before and makes the film and the themes ultimately different. Most of the dubs don't do that. They don't really change the story. But this one does. And I don't really like that. Either way, this is sort of the resolution of the B-plot that just makes Shizuku... It makes her confront her own (laughs) density, as she puts it. Um... But her own just underst- understanding, realization that, you know, she doesn't know everything. She can't, she doesn't know what to do with herself. Here we have the music called Riding the Train. I know, it's a very original title based on the scene. This is... Seiji's theme, the the pre the image album version of Seiji's theme that was used for the end of summer, and is now just sort of the contemplation theme. <laughs> um, I love the instrumentation on this. It is on the album, the soundtrack album. Um, it reminds me a lot of the intro of Paper Mario with the Thousand Year Door. <laughs> Here she's taking the more direct route up to the top. Uh, going up all those steps that she usually runs down. I feel this, you know, she goes to the earth shop whenever she feels down or distressed. She doesn't quite know what to do and says, hey, maybe in here everything will feel like a fairy tale again and I'll be fine. This shot that was uh, closed is actually an added shot uh, in the second version of the storyboards. It wasn't in the original sort of storyboard script and then was added in uh, just to clarify that it was, in fact, closed. We're getting close to the midpoint of the film here, where it sort of turns on its head, uh, and the plot changes, and the chastic structure sort of reflects, starts to reflect in on itself. This is where everything that has sort of been bothering Shizuku in the first half of the film comes to a head. Where she reveals all of her fullest in- insecurities to the cat. Love that shot. There's some great artwork of that shot. Why do we change, I wonder? I was always so sweet. Books don't even excite me like they used to. There's always someone inside me saying, Things aren't that easy. I'm not very nice. This is what she says in the Japanese version. In the English dub, she's like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I just write corny lyrics. That's the other thing, like, in the Japanese version, like, her interest in fantasy and everything, you know, it's all sort of taken at face value. And it's not really belittled or called corny or anything, even if they're, like, trying to get it past the radar of trying to make people think it's not corny. But that's part of the charm of the film. It's wholesome. You know? The characters are much more cynical in the dub, and I'm not... I don't really like that. And it just becomes really unclear when she just uses the same catchphrases. Anyway, the shots in the in this scene from this point on are gorgeous. 
I've heard him called Ball at one place, or I've heard him called Tom, uh, Tama at one place. Tama Town, which is where they live, the name of the mountain. <laughs> and this is the first time that Shizuku and Seiji have, you know, actual, like, positive uh, <laughs> communication with each other. <laughs> and he's kind of taken aback by her wholesomeness and her straightforwardness about how much how she sees the world in the fantastic sense also music in the background this is okanomachi this is its final rendition in the film sort of back to the original instrumentation but brought to a fuller extent um (laughs) that gets planted and paid off later And here, if it wasn't clear before, they definitely are nervous around each other. They, like, this scene makes it clear probably more than anything that they do have budding feelings for each other, but don't really know how to communicate it yet. And here there's a, it, the, the chorus comes in gorgeously uh, as she views... Uh, the city now from the World Emporium balcony, even more beautiful than she had seen it before. And the first half of the film comes to a dramatic ending. This tracking shot where you can see all of it and it tracks over to Shizuku looking over it on the balcony also gets a parallel shot around to this time in the second half of the film. And here we have Chekhov's cello (laughs) and Chekhov's cymbals. Or tambourine, rather. Now, this track, Engel Zimmer, this is originally an original piece from the Image album that actually has vocals to it. A lot of the songs in the Image piece uh, have lyrics that the final version doesn't. Um, The instrumentation is a lot like the uh, Earthshop theme from the final version of the soundtrack. There's a here we hear the first glimpse of the Baron's theme when the light hits the eyes and she sees it. I love Baron's theme, and it comes back in a few other places and in The Cat Returns. In the Japanese version, he says, The Baron won't go. He won't be sold. He's a treasure to Grandpa. It means something to him, but he won't say what it is. In the English dub, they take this time to introduce Louisa as a concept. That there's a Baroness doll that belongs with the Baron, and that he won't be sold until he's reunited with her. And then she spends the dialogue talking to the Baron, asking about the Baroness, rather than talking about how she really wants to see the Baron all the time and how he looks sad. So there's a very clear, like, narrative difference there in terms of what gets introduced. The idea of Louisa as a character doesn't come into play in the original version until Nishi talks about his lady friend from Germany uh, during the fireplace scene when he goes and he talks about his past. In which case, the whole Baroness being in Shizuku's story is a coincidence, rather than it being set up in this scene, as it is in the English version. I just love all of the shots when it cuts to the outside and you see the way the light reflects off the city. Okay, here we go. This is the midpoint of the film. This is everything is building up to this, and then everything afterward plays off of what happens in this scene. This is the the most important scene in the film, the central centerpiece of the thing. This is the center of the ring 
uh, if you're doing a chiastic structure analysis of this film, uh, where we see this is where all of the, the film's themes, literary themes, not musical themes, but literary themes comes into play. And, and then, it, of course, it is also musical because this is when uh, there's a full instrumentation version of Country Roads. The only other time that happened in the film is at the very beginning with the English version and at the very end with the Japanese version in the credits. And then, of course, here's where we're introduced to Seiji's artistic interests uh, and how they fit together perfectly with Shizuku's artistic interests, which is writing and his is music and crafting instruments. And together, they just make a beautiful song. The way that Shizuku reacts to the violin here is sort of my key to understanding this whole character. You made this. It's like magic. To which he replies, how can you talk like that with a straight face? You're saying like weird things. She's like, why not? It's like, it's what I think. It's how I see the world. It really is magic. And, you know, if everyone thought that way, it would be wonderful. Part of the her progression of the film is that she sees the reality that things obviously aren't like that, but she doesn't lose her optimism toward the future, even if she loses her naivete. It's also just really cute, and also romantic, if you want to read it in that sense, the way that the two of them go off. Actually, it is very romantic, because there's like small little cues, like he'll wink at her, like very briefly, and then she'll just start to very slightly blush even more in the following seconds and her voice breaks <laughs> very small details that violin tuning is on the original soundtrack but those other songs i was telling you about before aren't it's it's weird it's really it doesn't i don't i don't get it either way here's this version of country roads now the english dub version actually is pretty good and relatively uh, consistent with the theme of what Shizuku is writing. So I applaud them for that. And they did a good job getting around. This is weird that it's not just country roads. <laughs> but I think Yoko Hana's performance of the song is just wonderful. There's the wink. And there's the voice break and the extended blush and smile. <laughs> Yes, I know all the Japanese lyrics for this. And it is taking every essence of my being not to sing it. One of uh, these friends uh, of Nishi's is voiced by Toshio Suzuki, the executive producer of the film, uh, who I believe is the producer of all of the Ghibli films. I'm just enjoying the music. I mean, this is the iconic scene of the film that a lot of people sort of remember. And it sticks out in their minds. And it's beautiful. And it's like, what the heck? They just burst out into song and it's it works? Yeah. It is like a fantasy in that way. Also, this shot of Shizuku as she's singing is absolutely wonderful. Also, I love this scene so much, I'm going to ignore the fact that she's clapping on 1 and 3 instead of 2 and 4, like you should. <laughs> but it's fine. Shizuku is not a musician. The recorder solo that one of his friends plays there um, is also in the bridge of the Japanese version in the credits. So Seiji is a very good violinist. And I just love watching Shizuku's expression in that shot as she's, like, looking in awe at him as he's just going to town. And then she's just, like, smiling and having a great time by the end of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> In Japanese, he goes, Nice vocal. <gasps> the grand reveal. <laughs> and they go immediately back to bickering. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> also love how it takes over half the film for one of the main like the the second main character to have his name revealed <laughs> and the two of them are just like watching in awe <laughs> my image of Amasawa Seiji was someone quiet and gentle That was a scene where, if you missed it, she's, that's when she said the thing about being buried alive and then the sky falling in, which uh, pays off what was said earlier in the library. This is where we're going to start getting a lot of the payoffs. So this track is called The Stars and Horizon. Um, it's a beautiful track that I don't think reprises at any point, um, but it's, it's, it's really lovely. Lots as good as me. That's another thing that just sort of becomes increasingly impossible in a digital modern world where, you know, the conventional, you know, apprenticeships and, um, you know, craftsmen being replaced by mass production and all that you know he wants to become an apprentice he wants to become a craftsman that's really not something that is a conventional career path um i've got no idea at all i just go from one day to the next first off relatable also that's just a summation of basically how shizuku feels for the entire first half of the film also beautiful lighting But yeah, they're both sort of going against non-conventional, like, career paths, even within American systems, but especially within Japanese school systems in 1994. By the way, if you're listening to this, just thanks for watching like up to this point and thanks for sticking with me i don't know if you've watched whisper of the heart before i guess you must have if you're listening to this commentary but this is the point where i reveal myself as the one of the world's biggest whisper of the heart fans ever uh my twitter account at at greater things um is very often just me gushing about whisper of the heart <laughs> so go follow me on twitter if you want more of my whisper of the heart thoughts that might not necessarily make it into this commentary I remember reading a review of this film being like, you can, you can tell that it's the first time effort of a director, because it was Yoshifumi Kondo's first film, and only film, unfortunately, because he passed away from an aneurysm in 1997 or 1998, uh, which prompted Miyazaki's first, first retirement, um, where the, the review points out, there's a shot in the film where Shizuku just fumbles around on the table, then gets over and turns off the light. And it's like, why is this necessary? What does this add to the film? It's sort of amateurs. They're like, it's sort of amateurish in the way that it's handled. But it's like, no, it actually serves to continue to show how close Shizuku is to her desk as she's sleeping. So that when her sister moves out and we see the massive distance, there's, there's a lot of like emotional impact between the two comparisons. And yeah, upon first viewing, like... You won't pick up on it. But the details are there when you read it like any other literary text. Also, we're dealing now with the aftermaths of the Sugimura subplot. And so much has happened since then in Shizuku's world. But now she has to sort of deal with that happening in addition to what she said to Sugimura. And this is why 
the Japanese version in this case probably makes more sense that the argument scene is more focused on Shizuku being semi-interested in Amasawa being the main reason why she's not going out with Sugimura rather than Yuko. Although I do like the character change that it's because of Yuko. When he says, did you see Sasuke on TV last night? Uh, that's Ninja Warrior, if you didn't know that that's the English counterparts to Sasuke. <laughs> this is a great joke, but it's also from the original manga. Literally, it's like the same formula and everything. I recommend reading the original manga if you like the film, uh, just to see the comparison. Because it's a very different kind of story, uh, but a lot of the story beats are similar, but just the theme, the themes are different. Uh, when I saw this in theaters, this was the scene that the most people laughed at. Uh, it is very funny. <laughs> um, there's a great detail that often gets obscured in one of these shots. Were obscured by people in the front. Uh, Sugimura looks really upset in the background, right there against the window. But there's just people in the foreground that are sort of blocking his subdued reaction, which I really appreciate. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, this might not have been the best course of action for Seiji to uh, tell her. But then again, Seiji's not the best at communication anyway. I mean, he spent all this time trying to, like, impress her or get her to like him but instead of making her think that he was a jerk and then you know doing the whole thing with the book cards rather than just actually just straight up talking to her <laughs> although it is it is kind of sweet that uh he was just so excited that he wanted to tell her first and that's what that shot of her looking surprised like communicates to the audience that she that she understands here we have um the first oh my goodness that like that expression the shizuku's expression expressions in this scene are a master class on their own honestly because there's so many emotions that run through her face. Like, she's so... Like, she's sad, but she's also happy. But she's trying not to show it that much. Sorry. So, this song... Uh, <laughs> that gets... That's the payoff from earlier. Um, this is the first in instance of the leitmotif of the second half of the film. Which I just call canon. Because that's one of what the later versions is called. I believe this one is... Floating clouds, rainy hills, or something like that. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful theme. Um, and it's called canon because there's a version later on that's in canon. And that's just the name that I give to it because it's easy to say. <laughs> and then here we see Shizuku struggle... In the second half of the film, where, wow, Seiji's already figured out what he wants to do, and I'm still stuck, and I was thinking maybe we could go to the same high school and figure it out, that's, it's sad. And also, these are the things where they change a lot of this dialogue in the English dub to make these story beats along Shizuku's, like, growth a lot less clear, and it sort of becomes more about the dialogue between them rather than their own feelings. So that was like, oh, I'm just, I'm so embarrassed. I shouldn't have said that. Then here's where Seiji pretty much just reveals his feelings for her. Um, without saying as much, which comes up later in the film as well, where they're arguing, did he actually say that he liked you? But it seems like that's pretty much what he's saying. Also... I love this dialogue. I'll sing your song to myself in Italy. They changed that in the English dub, where it's like, pretty bad diming, huh? She's like, yeah, it's pretty bad. 
It's like, that doesn't really mean the same thing, thematically or emotionally. Also, it means a lot because it's not just like, I like you. It's like, I like you, but I respect your art so much that I will carry your art with me even when I'm not around. So it's also the Kunstler Roman, which is the growing up story of the artist. It's also an important theme for the Kunstler Roman aspect of the story rather than just the romance. Even if you're, you know, aromantic or, like, that's not something that you find interesting inherently, this film is so much more than that as, like, a simple one-dimensional romance plot full of cliché. It's the complete opposite. It's funny, uh, Shizuku's father looks a lot like Miyazaki. And, I mean, he looks that way in the original manga. He makes one appearance in the manga, and he looks very similar. But I'm pretty sure a lot of the uh, influence in terms of temperament and personality uh, from the manga to the film comes from a lot of Miyazaki himself. <laughs> I like Yuko's uh, pink blazer in this scene, specifically designed to make her stick out from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the Tokyo pedestrians. That's the word I'm looking for, pedestrian. <laughs> then we have the not passing the Bechdel test scene, <laughs> where they just talk about boys i mean this scene does have more than just boy talk but <laughs> this is sort of like the conventional american perspective but it also shows you know the difference in wealth between yuko's family and shizuku's family where she lives in the house full of a nice bed and a tea set and all this other stuff um whereas shizuku lives in a small cramped apartment when they're hard working. So there's even like a class struggle element to this film. <laughs> so here, he likes you, doesn't he? He told you as much. Now I'm not so sure. Well, so that's them not really certain about what, if what he said was a confession or not. Whereas in the dub, it's pretty much specifically a confession. You can't say go for it to someone who's already going for it. Or to someone more ambitious than you. Can't you be in love without your future planned out? I ask myself that all the time. All of the third years liked your translation of Country Roads. You can also express yourself too, unlike me. That's something that I feel about Yuko. I think my personal problem is that I have trouble expressing myself. This is the moment where Shizuku's where the second half of the story really kicks in. Where she decides... It's decided. I'll write a story. Which is also the name of the song. So this is a version of canon. Which turns into a version of Chasing the Cat. And then changes back into canon. <laughs> we, have t we have tests. I don't care. <laughs> that perfectly sums up Shizuku's attitude for the second half of the film. This is an example I always look to personally. I'm like, you just have to make some art of your own, right? Grow and learn, and you'll be able to express yourself and feel like you have a purpose, and not just going from day to day doing nothing. But, you know, it's hard to make things sometimes. So I try to, you know, do song covers or write stuff when I can, when I'm not working. Here we have the example of the little girl calling him Muta, which... For example, which for some reason was the name that stuck in The Cat Returns. So I'm guessing the cat's name, Moon's name in her story is Muta. And I think that was the time when she decided, oh, that's the name I'm going to give the cat and the villain cat in my story. And that's why Muta's name is Muta in The Cat Returns, if you go by that theory.
also what she's writing there on the first page uh you see more of what she writes specifically in the manga and like that dialogue is the same stuff the, the exact same lines that are also said in the the manga itself all right let's get some water Wow. First time I've noticed, there's a new clock right there. It's a different clock. <laughs> to replace the other one that was just sitting there for three years. Every time you watch this movie, you find a new detail that you didn't notice before. It's my favorite kind of movies that are like that. So that's the detail I've noticed this time. So here we got the metaphor of um, the rock and the emerald ore inside and this was another example that the review pointed to to being like this is pretty amateurish in terms of like it's pretty conventional metaphor but also she's like 14 right like <laughs> she's figuring out how to write for the first time and you know it's i think it's a good metaphor and you know it inspires her and it inspired, this is Rebecca Sugar, and I should also mention that Rebecca Sugar, the creator of Steven Universe, Whisper of the Heart is her favorite film. So, that's awesome. <laughs> Makes me feel validated that this is also my favorite film. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff with gems and ore uh, in Shizuku's story. And here we have Nishi explaining the metaphor. <laughs> but it's 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 pretty apt, you know. It's basic, but it works. Also, the original script makes it clear that what he's talking about when he says if you polish it it would be worthless. It makes it pretty clear he's talking about the rock on the outside rather than the emerald ore on the inside. <laughs> which you know is actually what he's supposed to be talking about I'm scared what if there isn't a beautiful crystal in me that's literally what every single artist deals with right imposter syndrome like I'm not a good artist I'm just doing crappy work that other people seem to like for some reason or they just pretend that they like here we go so here's the first uh, fantasy sequence of the film there's two of them and then there's a dream sequence as well where we have the baron who looks different than he does in the cat returns because this is his original design the character the main character in uh the story is not shizuku but it's very clearly a shizuku insert i believe they're voiced by the same voice actress in both versions as well uh carrie elwes who was the voice of the Baron in the English dub of The Cat Returns, which was done first, uh, came back to voice the Baron in the English dub of Whisper of the Heart, which is a great detail. And he doesn't get a lot of dialogue, so they add a little bit of dialogue in a few places so that he gets more to do, I think. <laughs> also, this track is amazing, and it's another version of the Baron's theme. Uh, there's a famous uh, Japanese painter that did a lot of the backgrounds of the fantasy sequences, a uh, surrealist painter. Uh, can't remember who it is. Um, but on the special features, you can see some of those uh, paintings. This shot is my favorite shot in the film, where it pans down and it's Shizuku coming down the steps. This is the background on my phone. <laughs> Where now we see, now we're so intimately familiar with these settings and the way that one location leads to the next and how these characters get from point A to point B that, like, you can track all of that across the entire film and every day in the film really well. It's, it's really surprising, like, how easy it is to go from point A to point B uh, in this movie. Like, she's walking down the steps, 
because she just came from Nishi's shop where she got the ore, and now she's in the library, which is at the bottom of those steps. So even though you're going from one scene to the next, they're all connected. Even if you don't see the specific connections. Now, I was not sure what this wood grain thing was about until I read the manga and I realized it's probably just a reference to Seiji being a painter originally. And one of the things being that he's painting Shizuku uh, without her realizing that it's her that he's painting because she looks like older and uh, more mature and arguably, I suppose, more lovely. I don't know. Either way, that was another musical cue that is literally on the soundtrack. It's ten, it's like less than 10 seconds long, and yet some of those other cues that I talked about before aren't. I'm still upset. <laughs> if someone knows where to find the rest of those musical cues, please let me know. Here is the actual use of canon as the title of this theme. This, the interactions between these two are also some of my favorite facial reactions in the film. This shot. And this one of the two of them looking across from each other. And smiling. And then going back to their reading and studying. So lovely. Couple goals, am I right? They were probably there studying all night. How romantic. I always love the shot because we see Shizuku about to say something uh, when the car starts to come by. I'm sorry, I'm always so depressing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a line that relates to a lot of people now, I think. Right here, where Shizuku starts to say something and then doesn't. And the car goes by. And then he goes. <laughs> and then her on the train back, she thinks up the next part of her story. The background of the Baron. And this is the second fantasy sequence. The first, this is the actual first appearance of Louisa in the original version. First off, damn these matte paintings. Like, wow. Also, if you notice, some of the people here are like cat people. So, clearly it's the ideal society. Also, I love the idea that, you know, magic lives and in, the, in, in simple artisans flowed the blood of sorcerers, right? And that's how they're able to make magical dolls that can come to life. Like the Baron and Louisa. But then... I always think of these, uh... This bug that Muta's riding on. It took me a while to realize that was Muta. Because <laughs> he's in, like, the, the hat and all that. Uh, that bug he's riding on reminds me a lot of something from Nausicaa or Laputa. We can see now that it's the next semester because the, the, the uniforms are different. And this is a small detail in Japan that you would realize, oh, dang, the months have just gone by. <laughs> uh, we are now in another, we are, we've just switched to the next sem semester. Although I guess technically the Japanese school system operates on trimesters and like, this is, I think, the second trimester? I don't... I don't remember. But there we get the specific date, where it's October 1994. It starts in the late summer, and then now it's the fall. So some months have gone by. Whereas before, most of, like, the, the first part of the film took place pretty much over the course of, like, three or four days. Now we're going to skip forward months through some of these, uh, or weeks more accurately uh through some of these uh last scenes here's where the divide between shizuku and her family which sort of represents her um social obligations 
um, becomes more emblematic. There's also a translation that says, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't want to eat. Um, and then of course she pulls out a protein bar. <laughs> Or a calorie stick, more accurately, I think. It was a certain type of uh, Japanese snack. Some of these scenes are some of the few scenes in the film that Shizuku doesn't appear in. So it's actually kind of weird to see just the rest of the family sort of on their own. And I think these scenes are important because up to this point we've only seen Shizuku from her own point of view. That we rarely see the family sort of on their own. Uh, thinking about their own problems. So these scenes sort of set up their point of view and make them relatable characters um, in terms of wanting to relate to them. Uh, when they get to the argument, so you're not just always on Shizuku's side, you understand the both sides of the argument. I love that um, Shizuku's mother is, you know, getting her master's degree. Like, she's going to graduate school. She's a progressive woman <laughs> at this time. Um, and that sort of point of view ends up informing why they're able to let Shizuku sort of do what she wants, even though it's off the beaten path. In the English dub, it's like, her grades are so bad. But, of course, in the original, it's specifically her class ranking. She's gone down 100 places. And that scene is important because we get to really... Yeah, so we get the positive point of view from the rest of the family. Instead of just cutting to this scene where they're just arguing with her, it just makes the whole family much more likable rather than us only being on Shizuku's side. Obviously, in America, you can't do anything with a middle school education because high school is compulsory, but not so in Japan. So there are people who are around who just never go to high school. And they just live their life. Uh, and things become increasingly more difficult for people that don't want to go to high school in order to succeed or really make any sort of living at all. Um, sort of like how it is now, where it's very difficult to make a living if you don't go to college in America. I really respect Shizuku's father, where, you know, He's firm, and he's a parent, and he makes um, firm decisions about the family and, like, what should happen with the children. But he's not, he never, he never yells. He always listens. He understands their point of view, but is gentle at, at the same time. I really, I love this family. This is the kind of... <laughs> This is a, it's a good thing. This shot here lasts for a long time. I have the storyboard book right here. Let me see if I can see how many seconds it is specifically. Because it is a long time. But you don't really notice because the uh, soundtrack artwork is or artwork the soundtrack work is so good that you just sort of hear what's happening off outside of the shot and you know what's happening 26 seconds that shot lasts it's just checking the storyboard book it has the length of the shots in seconds 
in addition to each of the shots. It's, it's really well done, and I recommend uh, tracking it down if you can. <laughs> I know my parents are kind of a lot like this with me, where they're like, you never tell us things. How are we supposed to know what you're doing? <laughs> they have to, like, pull it out of her. This is a big surprise. And also, you know, sort of against the grain of society at this point. Where do what you believe in. Do, do what you feel is right. But it's not easy when you walk your own road. You'll only have yourself to blame if you fail. Like... I mean, it's harsh, and it's really not the sort of thing that, you know, Hollywood, like, parents would tell children in an American movie. They'd be like, follow your dreams, and everything will be fine, you know, the sort of, uh, <laughs> sort of mentality. Uh, whereas, this film is a lot more practical, <laughs> especially given, uh, sort of the restrictions on, like, what sort of paths that people can take in the schooling system at this point in time. So here's where we see, yep, she's leaving. Soon, Shizuku will be all alone. And that, the difference between this shot and then the shot immediately after Shizuku's dream sequence highlights that more significantly. As a kid, I, I watching this film, I always thought this was a part of the story, but you can see it's Shizuku herself. It's not her OC uh, self-insert character. So this is very clearly just a dream that she's having, or I suppose a nightmare. Uh, Forest of Doubt is the name of this uh, of this uh, track. She's like, oh, it's the beautiful crystal inside me. But it's hideous. This second half of the the theme is not on the soundtrack, but I really like it. And you can see now the bed's all the way over there. It is now weeks later. She looks back at the Seiji picture. And for the only time in the film, that's Country Roads in the musical score. I'm guessing this is the reason why it's not on the soundtrack, for whatever reason. It's very lovely. And then here we go. The Here we have a parallel dream sequence. <laughs> I need to do more thinking and analysis about how these two dream sequences are related. Obviously, sort of, Louisa is the memory of um, his time back in Germany before the war. Um, also, love the, the shading in the background of those trees there as she's walking through. And we see later on in the film, he says, You've brought the Baron out of my memory and back to life again. First off, that's heartbreaking. Ugh. Anyway, um, so, I mean, it's kind of weird to see them so closely paralleled where it's like, Shizuku is the new Louisa? What is even that supposed to mean? But it's the sense of these are the people that are bringing the Baron to life for Nishi. Uh, just bringing this this simple cat doll to something fantastic, something greater than than it is sort of in normal reality, bringing part of the fantasy and the wonder and optimism into the world. That's what she's doing with her story. Whisper of the heart, or Mimi Wosumasuba. This is the emotional climax of the film. It doesn't seem like it on first glance, 
because there's not really dramatic music or anything leading up to it like there would be in a Hollywood score where you'd be like, this is the big grand moment. It's more quiet. It's more subdued. And honestly, if you're an artist and you've ever showed anyone your work for the first time, you know this feeling. Just this feeling of dread, like, oh god, I, why am I doing this? <laughs> I, this shouldn't be shown to anyone. I should just burn it. <laughs> and that's absolutely how she feels in this moment. This shot always fakes people out. When I was in the theater, I heard a, a few subdued gasps. And then released breath, and they realized, oh, CD is not actually there. <laughs> it makes people really upset. <laughs> it's, okay, I'll acknowledge it's a little bit cheap, but it's it's effective at making people feel like, damn, he's absent, and that means a lot. So this is the payoff of the previous tracking shot, where we track over to Shizuku now, but she feels very different this time, and her hands... That's a wonderful detail. Her hands um, shaking on the post. She is very cold, even though she won't admit it. And then here we have these shots of the cars going by, paralleling, and the train, and the airplane. Once again, more things about flight. And in fact, that could be the very same plane that Seiji arrives on, because he comes to see her so early in the morning. Um... Anyway, I knew that that shot of the plane was significant, because there's also a shot of the plane in the manga. And I always really find something really meaningful about that shot, personally, uh, in my own writing, that I think about a lot. But it, anyway, it also uh, is a reprisal of the cityscape from the beginning of the film. rough blunt and finish just like Sadie's violin and this is where it really becomes clear where her story has been leading this whole time what she says when sh she cries here and it's really not like the arc is not clear in the English dub but in the Japanese it's just so it's so much simpler and it makes so much sense Catharsis. It's nice that Moon was keeping her company. You know, he's not a he's not a jerk, completely. Here we go. Now that I've written it, I know. Wanting isn't enough. I have to learn more. But Seiji's getting further and further ahead. Felt I had to force myself to write, and I was so scared. That explains sort of Shizuku's motivation for this entire second half of the film. So, here we go. So, uh, coming up soon is sort of the reveal of... Baron is in a magic statue because we finally see for the first time a shot that the Baron and Moon share. So they're not the same person. And obviously, I mean, it's not, the story isn't a fantasy. Um, it's the fantasy story in real life. <laughs> it's a fantasy story if it wasn't a fantasy. <laughs> the fantasy story of becoming an artist. There we go. There's the shot where we see the Baron and Moon both together. This is where everything gets revealed. In the manga, I should mention, he was part of a shipping company, and that's why he was in Germany and he traveled a lot. Whereas in the film, he was a student in Germany. This whole coincidental element of Louisa uh, being sent off to be repaired and Shizuku writing about it in her story, even though she didn't know it was what was actually happening. Again, that's just not in the English dub. 
So actually, the only sort of coincidental fantastic element got taken out of the English version. Take take that as you will. I feel like it's more... Ex you know, I don't actually know if it's more explicitly romantic between Nishi and Louisa uh, in the English version as opposed to the Japanese version. But there's definitely always an undercurrent there of romance. But the, the statues are given more of a significance than any sort of relationship that they would have had. Uh, I mean, clearly because he went off to have a children with it, someone else. <laughs> Otherwise, Seiji wouldn't exist. Your story brought the Baron out of my memory and back to life. That's the significance that Shizuku has for him. That's why she's the new Louisa. Not because he's like a creepy old man. <laughs> and that's also one of the things I love about Nishi as a character, is that they find all the ways to make him not creepy. <laughs> Even though he's, you know, best friends with a 14-year-old girl. Like, it's not creepy. It's kind of like the, the Little Prince movie. Now finish up your story. So this is what my friend wanted to see. My friend wanted to see, like, the story when it was finished. And, like, what the response to all that was. But you don't need to see that in this film. Y you understand her arc. You understand where she is at and how she's grown uh at this point and you trust obviously she's going to finish her story she's going to make it amazing and a, an awesome fantasy book because that's just how these stories are gonna go and then here we get the resolution of the family plot i mean it was sort of it was sort of resolved before, but this is the, um, the final resolution. Your trial's all over? For now. <laughs> and I like how it's the mother, because... First off, it's it's the chiastic structure, right? I mean, the mother is the first person that she talked to at the beginning of the film. Uh, and they argued over something petty, but now they have a deeper understanding of each other and their own individual drives of what they want to do with themselves. And always taking on new challenges because it's important to them. And then we get a moment with the dad as well. We don't really get a moment with the sister, but the moment in the bunk bed earlier uh, where they're back on good terms it pretty much just fills that spot. Parents are very kind. And then here we have the final scene of the film. Gorgeous pre-dawn shots. Love them to death. Now, I suppose I'm not sure if there's really anything in the story to suggest that this is the specifically has to be the next day, but she's wearing the same clothes. She's under the comforter in the same way. Uh, I'm going to assume that it is the next day and that the airplane from the night before is Seiji's airplane coming back. Love, love that. Love that. <laughs> And he's back. And we get a grand statement of the Baron's theme, which is an interesting choice because the Baron's theme was just written as the Baron's theme. But I find its application to this specific scene really thematically interesting and also perfectly fitting. Sometimes a composer doesn't need to use a leitmotif completely literally every time if you get the same emotional impact. I got an earlier plane. All right, let's throw all of the cliches in right now. Giving them the coat. Riding on the back of the bike. 
<laughs> Here is a major plot difference between the English dub and the, the subtitles. So in the Japanese version, he decides he's going to go back to Italy and he's going to do it. Whereas in the English dub, he decides to stay and finish high school and then go and do it. Now, I can't help but feel this was because Disney, who was making the English dub, didn't want kids who are inspired by Seiji to be like, I'm not going to go to high school and I'm going to go to Italy, which is what his decision is in this film. Uh, whether or not that works out for him, who knows? Uh, but I suppose they didn't want to take that chance, and so they make it so he's going to high school first, which, honestly, I'm not a fan of that change. Also, I love this sequence where he says he's going to ride her up this hill. He's pushing himself the same way that Shizuku pushed herself. And they don't really, he doesn't quite yet understand that, like, she has done, like, the same thing. And since the story is told from Shizuku's point of view, we don't see all of the lengths that Seiji goes to, to, like impress shizuku and like strive to be better for her sake as well as his own and but that that hill scene tells me that seiji has been doing basically all the same things that shizuku has doubting himself wanting to strive to achieve better uh, in order to match up to how he perceives her to be. But we just don't see it because the whole thing's from Shizuku's perspective. But that hill scene is our hint that Seiji's going through, through the same thing. It really does look like the sea. It's a beautiful painting. Here's the final score cue of the film, Yoake, Daybreak. In fact, this, I believe, is actually what the canon music was written for, because the image album version of this theme is, day, is listed as Daybreak. So I imagine it was written for this scene and then got used for the entire second half of the film. Because this uh, sunrise scene is also in the manga, and... I mean, it's a beautiful fitting ending, you know? You start the movie in the dark of night, and then you end it with a sunrise. Like, it, it's just, you know... <laughs> that's, that's like, light and color theory in film analysis 101. <laughs> you start in the dark, and you end in the light. Grandpa told me everything. I didn't do anything to help. I was just thinking of myself. So maybe maybe Seiji didn't go all the same way that Shizuku did, but I like to think that he did in some way, in a different way. And she knows that she's going to study and go to high school instead because she knows that she needs to learn and grow in order to become a better writer, which is what her goal is. And they... This whole Mary thing, Miyazaki, apparently it was his idea because he wanted them to commit to something. I like it. Uh, I mean, will it work out? Probably not. But I think it's just, it means a whole lot in that moment. And it means so much to both of them. I think it's a great thing. And it just shows how much they've both grown in all this time. And it might be naive for both of them, but... That's the point, right? I mean, they're both only 14. <laughs> They've got a whole lot of life ahead of them. But at this point, this is the most important thing to them. And that really means a lot to me. <laughs> Where there's always more to our lives, but everything in our present state is the most important thing at that given time. And you'll look back on it and you'll think, well, that was silly. 
but you really wouldn't at the time. You would do the same thing. So yeah, so this is Yokohana herself singing the Japanese version of Country Road over the credits. I love how it's just Japanese text and then take me home country roads and it's just straight up the English credits. Uh, I love the details on the top here uh, of all the the students walking by. And I'll point it out as it comes, but, you know, Moon comes by. We see Yuko right there in her pink blazer once again. Uh, and then Yuko does show up later on. Uh, in fact, at the top uh, later on, it's revealed that Yuko and Sugimura go on a date together. Which, you know, sort of resolves that plot thread. It reminds me a lot of Nausicaa, where a lot of sort of, like, the very minor plot things are resolved, like, right in the end credits montage. There's Moon walking by. This is one of sort of, like, the high places. This is, like, where, uh... I'm just now thinking about where this actually is in the Tama Town place. Uh, it would be like the scene when uh, Shizuku and Yuko are discussing the love letter walking up the hill after school. I think that's basically where they're at right now. Uh, so there's Yuko just staying still, waiting for Sugimura to show up. I should also mention the lyrics to the Japanese version of Country Roads is fantastic. And here he comes. And he recognizes him because he's got the same bag. And obviously, I mean, it's just them because you can see their hair and everything. Maybe they don't go on a date. Maybe they just run into each other. But it seems like she's waiting for him. So I think they are going on the date after school together. Which is nice. Do Dolby Digital. There it is. First digital audio. Yeah, the film was created like... It's a, it's a digital file. But obviously it was like shot on film. And that's the end of the film. Directed by Yoshifumi Kondo. May he rest in peace. Yeah. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to me ramble about Whisper of the Heart. Uh, yes, it is my absolute all-time favorite film. I first watched it when I was 9 or 10 years old. So that would have been nine or ten years ago um i rented it from the library because i saw it was a studio ghibli film and i didn't know i hadn't heard about it up to that point and i watched the english dub because back then i just watched the english dubs of anime and i really loved it although the first time i watched it i was like yeah it was pretty good and then like a few weeks later i was like i really want to watch that again so i re-rented it from the library and i watched it again and again, and again, and again, and eventually I got my own DVD copy, and then finally, I was like, you know what, I've seen this movie so much, I really love it, I should try the original Japanese version, you know, because it's, I want to see what the original version is was like, and it was so much better in every single way that I never went back <laughs> to the dub, in fact, I, the first time I've watched the dub in like six or seven years was when I went to see it in cinemas, because I went to see both the dub and the subtitled. I have a whole thread on my Twitter uh, that you can find at at Greater Things, so the at symbol and then AT Greater Things, uh, where I go even more in depth as to, rather than here, as to all the different things about the dub that I liked and didn't like and stuff like that. So, yeah. I believe that's all. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I have another commentary uh, in this series that I did for Back to the Future. Uh, I did over a year ago. 
uh, I'll probably do another one of these at some point. I don't know what exactly. Probably something Star Wars. I might go back and do Back to the Future 2 and 3 at some point. Uh, if you like these commentaries and you want me to keep doing them, uh, just let me know. Anyway, this is Selling Smash. Thank you so much for watching. Go share Whisper of the Heart with all your friends because it is a fantastic movie. It is my favorite film of all time. And yes, thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye.